to Wednesday's uh, team lecture. Um, we had some great things talked about yesterday from Jacob. Um, if you weren't here yesterday, you missed out on some cool stuff. But if you're back for the second day, you know you're in for a treat. So uh, Jacob's going to be talking a little bit today about identity, some of the things that we can do as young people to, uh, to preserve our faith through our lives. So I invite your attention to Jacob Hudson's as he comes up to begin today. All right, good morning, guys. Welcome back. And for those who are here for the first time, I want to just say, especially to the adults in the room, I'm going to ask questions. I don't want adult answers, all right? I want young people answers. So if in some way you consider yourself young, you're free to answer. We're going to have some uh, interaction in a minute as we talk about this. Our topic this week is a faith that lasts. And we introduced this yesterday. The, the basic fact that I want you guys to remember and I want it to kind of be burned into your brain as something personal is the idea that 40 to 50% of kids who are raised going to church will abandon their faith in college or once they leave home. And our question is, how can we not be that statistic? What about me will be different? And so we're addressing some of the different areas that can be problematic. I want to remind you of our goals this week. We want to identify this problem, which is we need faith that's strong, that has roots, faith that is committed and passionate, faith that makes wise choices. Uh, we want to take the problem personally. This is not about everybody else in the world. It's about you and me. It's about our families. It's about our churches. It's about me and my walk with God. Uh, it's to take ownership of our faith, to listen to God's will, and then to trust God to strengthen our faith. I want us to do some work in that today because I want you to leave here stronger and more thoughtful than you were when you came. That's my goal. I want to do that by engaging you. I also want to do that by engaging the Bible a little bit. Uh, we talked yesterday about four basic categories of why people fall away, and we talked about misunderstanding the gospel. This is what we covered yesterday where we need to understand that the gospel is not for perfect people. You're not perfect. I'm not perfect. And so when you make mistakes, it doesn't mean you throw the gospel out or that you leave Jesus. It is instead the moment where you realize this is for me. And we also talked about Peter and Judas. Remember at the end how Peter and Judas both basically made the same mistake, and yet only one of them continued in his faith. One of them gave up. And we sort of have that decision and that path laid before us each time we make a big mistake. So the gospel is God's hope given to us because we're not good enough. It is not somehow qualifying only the perfect. And so I want you to understand that. Uh, there are three other uh, categories. Today we're going to talk about identity, learning who we are. And then tomorrow we're going to talk about relationships. And we're going to talk about some other stuff, media, dating, that sort of thing tomorrow. And then there's one we're not going to cover this week, which is issues with God that very often are at the core of why people lose their faith because they have some questions or some difficulties that they can't get over. All right, so our topic this morning is who am I? Who am I? We're going to talk about identity. All right, first question. Why is identity important? Why is it important to be able to answer the question, who am I? So that you're what? Okay. Here's where you guys talk. Why is it important? Yeah. Yep. Who am I? How am I supposed to connect with other people? Yep. Right. Right. I don't know who I am. I will struggle. No foundation. No grounding. Can I ask the question, why do young people often struggle defining themselves? Why is this hard, especially for young people? Yeah, in the back. Oh, because Okay, so there's a, maybe a social pressure of the world's telling you be like this. God says something different. What else? Somebody have a hand up over here. I thought someone. Yeah. Limited experience in life. Limited experience. In life. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Okay, limited experience with life. I don't know who I am because I haven't lived very much. Uh, I've only seen so many things. Yeah, behind him. You had your hand up. Yeah, go ahead. Right. So it's kind of hard to find that when you don't have a lot of uh, options. You're just kind of opening your eyes for the first time and figuring things out. Yes, ma'am. Right. Yeah, you're changing all the time. And as you change, sometimes your personality changes. Uh, sometimes you see different features of your personality and you become a different person or you interact with people differently or people treat you differently all of a sudden. And so, well, it feels weird. It's, I mean, who am I? What's going on? How do I understand myself becomes a really difficult question. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes you hear about, uh, like, uh, mentioning jobs. Uh, there are all kinds of jobs, and so you hear about all the different kinds, and you wonder, well, what, what should I be? And you kind of try on different hats, and you think, well, what, what would it be like if I did this job or did this job? What about, what about this works for me? And it's hard because, you know, that's still years away in some cases, and yet you want to know just who am I, how do I fit, what makes sense about me, how do I work? Okay, um, Luke 12, 15, Jesus makes a statement. He is talking to a man who comes to him and says, hey, make sure that my brother divides the inheritance with me. And Jesus says, beware of covetousness. And he says, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And my question is, what does Jesus mean when he says that one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions? Take a minute and think about it. Tell me what you think he means. Yep. Okay. Doesn't matter how much stuff you have, right? Doesn't matter because there's something bigger than stuff, right? He calls it one's life. So what does that mean? One's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Right. I just want you to think about this. Like that idea... There is more to you than your stuff. Your life is distinct from your stuff. One's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. You are not your stuff. You're not what you own. You're not how much money you have. He says your life is bigger, deeper, more important than that. All right? Jesus also says, this is in Matthew 6, 25, is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing. Okay, what do you think that means? It's not life more than food and the body more than clothing. What does that mean? I'll hear from you guys. Yeah. It means that our food given a purpose to live, not just to go back Yeah. There's something bigger. We've been given a purpose, and it's about more than stuff, more than clothes and food. And so we need to keep our vision on that. But there's also kind of the implication that we get distracted, right? And we kind of get focused on the stuff instead of focusing on what life's really about. Yeah. Say it again. Yeah, more valuable. You have more value. And Jesus says that a lot about us. You know, you're of more value than many sparrows, and God knows the number of hairs on your head. You matter, your life matters, but your stuff, eh, 
it kind of comes and goes. Or there's more to your body than just what you put on. There's more to your life than just how you stay alive. You are not intended by God to just survive. That's the idea. There is something to your life. You matter. And Jesus is saying, look deeper. If you are wondering, who am I? You have to start with the idea that you're not just surviving and you're not just here to get stuff and accumulate stuff that's not really going to fulfill you. There is something deeper. All right. I want to uh, put this up as a series of what I call false identities. And I want you to think through this because we're going to talk about in this class what it is that we identify as, who we think of ourselves as. And I think some of these, if you read them, you'll kind of say, eh, that's not really, that sounds a little strong, that's not really me. Uh, but there are some of these that I think probably we need to be honest and say, I kind of do identify that way. And I'll tell you which ones are that way for me. Uh, so these are the false identities. Uh, I am what I buy or what I own. Okay, so if you have this identity, the thought is, when I get that car, it will change who I am. You know, that car defines me. Or these clothes, you know, when I buy certain kinds of clothes, maybe that certain, you know, whatever style or whatever brand, then everybody will like me better. Everybody will see how important I am. If I have something that's kind of quirky or interesting, Maybe even, you know, I get my apartment and I furnish it just this way that's really cool. Then people will know that I'm really cool. And they'll think good things about me because they'll see my stuff. I am what I buy. I identify with that. So, of course, the problem here is with that identity, if I can't buy stuff, I don't really know who I am. Or if I can't afford really cool stuff and I can just afford regular stuff, then I'm not a very important or special person. Second identity is I am what I look like. I think this is a real challenge for us. This is, you know, you look at my body, you look at my face, and this becomes who I am. I identify with that. And so I want you to praise how I look. I need that because you're telling me I matter. Now I have value just because you like what I look like. And so very often this will motivate us. It will motivate us to try to present ourselves in the best way. But also the problem with this identity is not everybody likes what I look like. Sometimes I don't like what I look like. Sometimes what I look like changes. Sometimes, you know, my hair might fall out or I might gain weight or I might not be able to present myself in a way that everybody finds flattering. And so I really struggle with this. I think particularly if you base your life and your value on what you look like, you will find that getting older is the worst thing in the world. Because it's scary. You don't look the same as you used to look. And it feels like you're not who you used to be. Another false identity is I am my job. We kind of talked about this. Uh, and, and I know you guys, you know, probably a few of you have jobs, but probably not a career like you will. But when you join a career, very easily that begins to define you. If, if I am what I look like is kind of more of an issue for girls, I am my job is kind of more of an issue for guys. That is, you know, I can suddenly tell people, oh, don't worry, I'm a, I'm a fireman or... I'm an accountant, or I'm a preacher. That's what I do. And see, with that, when I tell you that, you think all these thoughts about, oh, he must be like this. Oh, I see. He's a preacher. That means he's like this and like this, and he thinks this and he does this. And I can tell you everything you need to know about me by telling you what I do. In fact, adults have these conversations all the time, particularly men, where we will say, well, let's ask a couple of things about it. If you want to get to know somebody, you say, well, what do you do? And then they tell you, oh, now I feel like I know them. But the problem with identifying with your job is, what if you lose your job? What if you have to change careers? Which happens. Suddenly, I don't even know who I am. And very often, people will go through identity crises when they don't have the employment they want. 
they struggle with that. And in fact, you guys may already be in this, especially those of you who are heading toward uh, moving on and becoming adults, that you may say, I don't know what I want to do. And it feels like there's so much pressure in deciding what job am I going to have because people are telling you all the time, you need a job that will fulfill you and give you happiness and joy. And you don't know what that is because you're 16 or 17 or 18 years old. And there's so much pressure on that because it's a way we're trying to define ourselves. Another false identity is I am what other people think and say about me. That is, if you like me, ah, I can bask in that. But if you don't like me, I am, I am totally devastated. And so if you have this identity... You will know what it's like to ebb and flow your whole day and the meaning of your life based on what someone might say about you. Maybe that's just gossip that you hear at school. And you know, so-and-so said such, such and such to so-and-so, and now, now I'm just so upset. Have you ever gotten upset just by hearing what someone else thinks about you? This is an identity issue. So we feel great or terrible at all times, but we can't say I have a stable sense of identity. I know who I am, and you're going to have to deal with who I am. Instead, it's no, you tell me who I am. Do I matter today? Do I matter to you? Am I valuable to you? And so up and down and up and down we go. This one is one of mine. This is a major struggle for me. Because of course, it's nice for people to say nice things about you, right? But there's a point at which that grows unhealthy. In particular, when I'm doing things just so you'll say good things about me. I'm no longer doing them because they're right or even because I want to do them. I'm doing them just to please you. And so that's a, an identity that won't stand. Another false identity is I am my problems. I am my problems. So uh, we all have things in our lives that are not perfect. And maybe even tendencies that are not perfect. And sometimes we'll begin to identify as those tendencies as those problems. So what we're saying here is things like, I am a hothead. That's who I am. Or I am superficial. Or I am someone who struggles with sexual immorality or sexual sin. That's who I am. And if we want to talk to people and present ourselves, sometimes we may even do that and say, here's who I am. And we feel like because we've done some things wrong or because we struggle in some areas, that's who I am. I need to tell other people or at least I need to know about myself. This is who I am. But of course, the problem with identifying as your problems is that's only a part of who you are. And if you focus on the worst parts of who you are, of course, you're going to be miserable all the time, right? Right? Because who likes to focus on their worst features? Another false identity is that I am a victim. This is that when things happen to me, I think of myself as the innocent victim. And things happen to all of us. I'm not saying that there's never a time where we're a victim. But when I'm talking about the identity of being a victim, I mean, it's that I trace through my life and see every time something happened to me that I didn't like, and now I kind of expect it. That when I meet you and you're new and we get to know each other, I just wait. It's going to come a time where you hurt me the way I've been hurt every time before. I am a victim. You are or someone else is or life is the perpetrator, but I can just expect that this is the way things are going to go. This is is a false identity. So I want you to know one of the reasons these are so important to expose and think about is in Jesus' speech and Jesus' mentality, they are not strong enough to handle life. You cannot go through life identifying yourself as one of these and survive. So Jesus says, lay up treasures in heaven and do not lay up treasures here on earth. Why? Why does he say that? What happens on earth? Where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. Do you remember 
The story of the rich fool who says, you know what, I'm, I'm doing so well, I'm going to tear down my barns and build bigger barns. What happens to that guy? God says, hey, terrible news. Tonight your soul is required of you. And then what are you going to do with all your barns? Who cares about your barns now? You see, there are more important issues than just what you own or what you look like. Jesus is the one who says that you build your house on the sand and the rains come and the floods come. And suddenly the, the strength of what you've built, the strength of your life is tested. It will happen to you just like it happens to all people. And if you're resting on, I need to know that I am the most beautiful person, or I need to know that I have the best job and everyone admires me, or I need to know that everyone loves me, or I need to know that you are seeing how broken I am, and I need to know that you are one who might hurt me again. I need to know something just so I matter. In that moment, that identity will break. And as Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Your heart will break too. I don't want that to happen to you guys. And the reason that matters is because that's one of the reasons people fall away from Jesus. Because when the crises of life come, they don't know who they are. So I want to take a minute and kind of talk through all of that. I want to take a minute and ask the question, who are we supposed to be? So here's my first question on that. What is Jesus' identity? Who is Jesus? This is easy. Son of God. Son of God. God. Jesus is the Son of God. Does Jesus ever wonder who he is? No. Does Jesus have an identity crisis? No. He knows exactly who he is. And I know that's a little challenging because, you know, it's the old, well, he's Jesus. You know, it kind of feels like a cheat to the question. He's kind of different than we are. Uh, But I want you to think about because Jesus knows who he is, Jesus doesn't wrestle with any of this stuff. Jesus doesn't worry about what he owns. In fact, he owns almost nothing. And nobody ever confuses Jesus with being materialistic. That's just not him. We don't even know what Jesus looked like, do we? It doesn't matter. Jesus could have been horribly ugly. It wouldn't change anything. That's not who he is. That's not what matters about him. Jesus is not defined by his job. In fact, the job he has, he seems to just completely abandon and doesn't really ever talk about it. If he was a carpenter, we only know that because we know one statement about him and his dad. I am what others think and say about me. Jesus isn't there. Lots of people said lots of stuff about Jesus, some of it good, a lot of it bad, and yet none of it deters him from his mission. Jesus is not his problems. Of course, he doesn't have problems in the same way we do. Jesus is not a victim, although he very much is a victim of tremendous injustice, but that never begins to define him. You see how it doesn't stick on him? It's not how he thinks of himself or presents himself. It's just not who Jesus is. Now, having said that, that's Jesus' identity. And I want you to think about how Jesus wants you to, to think of yourself the way he thinks of himself. All right, here's the part where I want to see if some of you guys will read Bible passages for me, all right? So uh, raise your hand if you're interested in reading, okay? Uh, If you read, you're gonna have to read loud enough for everybody to hear, okay? All right, Uh, so here are the passages. Let's start, Uh, Miriam, you got one. Matthew 6 and verse 8 be the first one. Somebody else? Matthew 6.32, somebody else? All right, uh, yeah, you got it. Um, Matthew 7.11, somebody else? Yeah, tall hand. Um, Matthew 5.9, Matthew 5.45. All right? So I want you to listen as these are read, and I want you to listen for the common thread. All right, Miriam, go ahead. Your father has, knows the things you have need of before you ask him. All right? Uh, Matthew 6, 32. For after all these things, the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly father knows that you need all these things. Your heavenly father knows that you need all these things. Matthew seven eleven. How 
How much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? You know how to give good gifts to your kids. How much more will your Father give you good gifts? Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, they shall be called sons of God. Matthew 5, 45. All right, so here he's talking about how we love our enemies and we become like our father. We'll become sons of your father because he is kind to the ungrateful and evil. He's kind to those who do evil to him. All right, so what's the common thread there in all those passages? Yes, okay, it does teach, all of those teach that. Or at least several of them. Yeah. It's supposed to be different from the world. A little more surface. Yeah. 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 God, I mean, those first passages talk about God as father. Several of them talk about us as sons or children. Okay. Jesus is saying, and this was a little bit revolutionary. That God wants us to think of him as our father. There are a couple of places in the Old Testament where that happens. Where God identifies as father or is called father. But it is not the common image for God in the Old Testament. But for Jesus, who of course knew the father in that special intimate way as the special only begotten son of God. He then tells us as his disciples. He says, here's how I want you to think of God. I don't want you to think of God as the terrifying king who you're scared of all the time. I want you to think of God as your father. Of course, God is still a king, and of course, it's right to fear him, but primarily, he is your father. Think about that picture. You are a child of God. Now, I don't know what your relationship with your dad is like, but I can tell you, whether that was a great relationship you have or an okay relationship or a terrible relationship. Whatever it is, there is some strong emotion as you think about your connection with your father, earthly father. And Jesus says all of that emotion is what you need to feel about your God. He is the father who is perfect. He is the father who loves you and provides for you. And when you are like him, it is a blessing to you. This is who you are. You are a child of God. I want you to think this way. In fact, I would really prefer if you just hear this in your head over and over and over again. So I'm going to repeat it for you for a little bit just so I get kind of earworm into your head. I am a child of God. I am a child of God. That's who I am. I am a child of God. I am a child of God. No matter how much money I have or don't have. No matter what stuff I have or don't have. I am a child of God. I am a child of God no matter what I look like. I am a child of God. I am a child of God. No matter what my career is or my job is at this moment, I am a child of God. That's who I am. I may be a child of God who's an engineer. I may be a child of God who's a teacher, but I am a child of God. That's what matters about me. That's who I am. That's the root of my identity. I am a child of God. No matter what other people say or think about me. If other people like me, I'm still a child of God. If other people don't like me, I'm still a child of God. I am a child of God no matter what my problems are. And I can list my problems for you, but they don't change the fact that I am a child of God. I am a child of God no matter what stuff has happened to me, what people have done to me, what situations I've been in that have been unpleasant. They don't define me. What defines me is I am a child of God. I want that in your brain. Because the time will come when you will start thinking about those things and some of them will matter too much to you. 
And sometimes those identities will disappoint you and your whole world will fall to pieces and what you will be left with is, but are you a child of God? That's who you are. That's how you answer the question, who am I? Jesus says, I want you to listen to me about this. And don't get mixed up in all the things that we grow too attached to. Instead, focus on the fact that you have a connection with your God. How do you think? I'm going to skip the second question here, although I would recommend, or the third question. I would recommend that you read 1 John 3, 2 to 3. It's an awesome passage. It's about being a child of God. And someday we will see our Father, and we will be like him, and we will see him as he is. And so there is motivation there. In fact, that is something, that is a passage that is one of my favorites in the Bible because it speaks to something so awesome, it's hard for me to comprehend. But I want to ask this question before we leave the identity idea. How might thinking of ourselves as children of God keep us from falling away from Jesus? That's our goal, right? So what connection could this have? There's a connection there, right? There's a family thing. And so we don't just abandon our family. Yeah, behind it. Um, a lot of times when people fall away from God, they have your sin very greatly and they're like, oh, Jesus can never forgive me. But since we are sons of God, um, God will always forgive us. No right. matter what we do. Yeah. Right. So there is that sense of I become defined by my sin. And Jesus is saying, no, you're still a child of God. You may need to repent. There may be some things that need to change. But it doesn't mean that suddenly you're not who Jesus says you are. Yep. All those other false identities, uh, I kept hearing the word I, mm -hmm. me. If we make our identity about ourselves, then it's going to break. But if we make our identity, if we center it on Christ and serving for him, serving him and working for him, then uh, that's when it's up to you. Well, it's something that will stand through time. Yeah, we, we connect our identity to something beyond us. It's not just about me. Am I happy? Am I feel fully uh, self-expressed or whatever it may be? Instead, I'm looking towards someone who's going to tell me this is who I am and this is what matters about me. That's outside us, but it's also not people. I'm not trusting you guys to tell me who I am. I'm trusting someone who knows me and who made me. All right? I want you to see that this is the underpinnings against which the, the tests of life will come. This is what the foundation is, that when you struggle, you come back to this. And I want you to know that, that the temptations you face don't happen in a vacuum. They'll happen in a time where you're trying to find out who you are. And I want to remind you, I am a child of God. That's who you are. All right. I want to talk for a minute about what are my gifts. So one of the struggles that happens as, especially as young people transition into adulthood, is that they often don't know who they are, and then they don't know what they can contribute. And they feel that maybe they don't have a place. Uh, I, I read to you the statistics yesterday about uh, the surveys that we've done that said a large percentage of our college kids, just where I preach, feel disconnected from the church and feel like they have very little spiritual interest. And sometimes that happens because they feel, well, there's no place for me in the church. I don't know how I fit in the church. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. I don't know, in other words, who I am and how I belong. So I want to talk for a minute about gifts. Uh, what does it mean to say that someone is gifted? Looking down here. Talented, all right. What does the word gifted imply? Yeah, they've been given something, right? I think we, we even have that language when we're not talking about God. People will say, oh, what a gifted athlete. Okay, well, who gave them the gifts? Oh, well, we don't want to talk about that. But it implies God, right? It implies someone's given gifts. And so when gifts occur, to say someone is gifted means, yes, they have a talent, they have a skill, they have an ability, 
and that ability doesn't come from them. All right, in your opinion, what are the most important gifts people can have? Anybody down here? I'm really looking down here. Most important gifts. Yeah. Public speaking. Public speaking? Okay. Ah, I like that one. Love? Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's a gift. I'm not sure I have it, you know, in the, but uh, it certainly has been a gift. Yeah. Uh, genuine care for others. Genuine care for others. Okay. Hospitality. Hospitality. Okay. Missions. Missions. Okay. Life itself, honesty, you, you, you feel it, like this is going to be varied, yeah, what you got? Um, I think all gifts are important if you use them for what God's doing. Yeah, well, that's the, the safe answer, right? Everybody's gifts are great. Yes. Think about what a wide variety of things were just mentioned, like we just took a little sprinkling, right? How many different things, yeah, public speaking and hospitality and love and, and going and preaching, all of these different arenas, all of us are going to think different ones of them are important, um, and we're going to have a different list, each one of us. How might we know what our gifts are? How do you know? Yeah? Huh? So how do, you, how do you know what your strengths are? You said it's about knowing our strengths. It's about knowing yourself. Okay. Some, the analytical person probably is going to think that they're someone else's feelings and pain a lot more analytically, a lot more on the chemistry side of it instead of the person who's caring right. emotionally. Right. Good. Good. Yep. Uh, experience. Experience? So you, you live enough of life and you kind of see what, what your gifts are? What you got? Oh, yeah, yeah. What's natural to you, right? What, what are your guess? I'm sorry, I, this, this ear doesn't work well for me. Um, so there's a what's natural, what our skills are, what experience shows us. Yeah. Yeah. So there's some of that that's just trying stuff, and uh, then you say, okay, well that's that's a talent or that's a skill, and maybe that's not. Uh, can I can I recommend if you don't know what your gifts are, which I'm sure all of us have some sense, but then all of us kind of have a uh, I'm not totally sure. Ask somebody who knows you well. They will tell you. And in fact, I think this is a good conversation to have. If you have parents that are present, ask them. If you don't, ask somebody who's your friend, who loves you and cares about you, not like your friend that's mad at you all the time, not that person. Um, but ask people who know you, and they'll tell you. And sometimes it's a very positive conversation because you'll say, what am I good at? And you get to talk nice about each other, maybe for the first time, especially I'm thinking you guys that don't always talk nice about each other. So think about that. The goal here is to get a sense of what God has given me that I can then use for his glory, as somebody mentioned already. Uh, does the fact that we may struggle the first time we try something mean we're not gifted and should just trop, stop trying? No. Okay, I think you could tell by the way the question's worded what I'm going for. No. There is a little bit of uh, effort that might be required. Uh, sometimes skills can be developed. And then sometimes you have to say, you know what, I'm just not very good at that. I've tried it and tried it. That just may not be my thing. So I want to encourage you, you're going to have a natural personality and a natural set of abilities. Everyone in this room does. And if you don't know what yours are and you can't think about them in a positive way, I want to encourage you to do some work on that. 
There's a reason why I want to encourage that. It's because if you can't figure out what you should be doing, it may lead to problems in your spiritual life. Because you may feel like, I don't know where I fit. I don't know what I should be doing. I don't know why I'm here. But if you know this is what I'm good at, this is who I am, then suddenly you can see a vision for why God put you on earth and made you the way you are. And that vision is how you progress in serving God. I want to put a couple of verses on the board here that are about gifts. Uh, this is Romans 12, 6 to 8. I know the writing is a little small. I'll do my best to read it carefully. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Now think about that. That means our gifts are not all going to be the same. Your gifts are not like mine and mine are not like yours. And that's okay. God made them that way. Let us use them. In pro if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. So you see how many different skill sets he describes here. Lots of different works, all of them necessary. This is uh, 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. God's varied grace is not the same. It's varied. It goes in different directions to different people. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. As you've received a gift, use it to serve one another. Do any of those surprise you? If I were to say, looking at these passages, any of the gifts, it would be this idea of one who exhorts, that there are some people who are just encouragers. It's just what they're good at. And we don't think about that very often. In fact, in my raising, when I would read these passages, there were basically two gifts in the environment in which I grew up. The gifts were preaching and song leading. And... If you weren't a good song leader, which I'm still not, then like you, you kind of missed out on half of it. And then the other one was preaching, and I, of course I ended up doing that. But, I mean, there aren't very many people who do preaching, and there aren't very many people who do song leading. So it kind of left everybody out. But the idea of being an encourager, man, I've known so many encouragers in my life. People who, it doesn't matter if they do those things in the public worship. The public worship is only a small fraction of how you live your life. God didn't just give gifts so we could have a public worship service. He gave gifts so that we could be people who glorify him in our everyday lives by encouraging one another. So I love the idea of exhorting. I love the idea that there's some people who do acts of mercy, who just have a heart for people. Somebody mentioned that earlier, who care about people and are always doing for people. Or down here, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. I want you to open your vision to this. Who is the giver of these gifts God is the giver of these gifts. What does he expect us to do with them? He expects us to use them to serve one another. He expects you to use your gifts for his glory. So here is the question I want to ask, and we're out of time. What are your gifts? Don't feel like you have to answer this. I want you to think about it personally for yourself. What are your gifts? I would recommend you come up with a list. These are my gifts. This is what I do well. This is where I excel. What areas do you excel in? What is unique about your personality? What interests you? Where's your passion? Where's your heart? I also want to encourage you to see the good and bad of your natural personality. Whatever it is, it has a good side and a bad side. You can say, oh, well, that's a person who's really passive. And I can say, well, that's a person who's really calm. And you could say, oh, well, that's a person who's really opinionated. And I can say, well, that's a person who's decisive. And you could say, well, that's a person who's really wishy-washy. He's always changing his opinion. I say, well, that's a person who's really relatable. Everybody likes him. Gifts. Gifts have both sides, and your personality has two sides. I want to encourage you to think positively about your attributes because then you're ready to see how God can use you. That's the goal. And then ask the question, how can you use these gifts to bless other people? I want you to think about what careers you could choose that would accentuate your gifts. And I especially want you to think that serving Jesus by serving others 
doesn't necessarily mean anything about what you do in a local church assembly. That's just not all there is to it. And if that's what you're thinking, as I mentioned, sometimes it can lead to you saying, I don't know where I fit and where I belong. I don't know what my purpose is because I don't preach or lead singing. And in my judgment, that is a mistake. So I would encourage you to think personally about your gifts, answer these questions, and let them be a centering thing so that you know who you are and what you're here to do. All right, guys, thanks so much for your attention. We'll pick up tomorrow by talking about relationships. I'll see you guys then.